Dr. Mahamud Bawumia or trend or much monka highway no so economy and send some no answer questions ever who or set the record straight. Bella Mundi, beside no question be, Bawumia answers our old man a month which say ah. Na debut and no answer and answer near him. Vanessa or no so beside question. Bet tax and one sense and Bawumia answer. Laya tag and Bawumia answer. Yabba coin some of the moon to details. Mashawa, so best share video we know about your wife and mommy or comment section hall. Afrix mobile money app and America men the amount who UK Canada US any part of the world that will be on us and it's going to be more Ghana. Master was all about signing up with the promo code TRANSGH to enjoy the best offers. So and Dr. Mahamud Bawomia who hosts media. Nini nana say media for no omombra na omombe bisa no question. Question bia e ha will be on bisa or no Dr. Bawomia oba ansa on pepepe. So nana ya okesi of peace FM nebusu ya oje microphone o bisa Dr. Mahamud Bawomia say Dr. In pen be brain and walk as I was you, who be the president, who be your way, who be the president, who be your way. Say, see, I'm going to win all your mates. Then, who bet me, I have found. But we may answer all my own. It was young. My name is Nanaya Kesi. I work with PCFM. You have promised abolishing bed tax, e levy, flat import duty, one time tax amnesty, among others. If you really believe that, that is what Ghana needs. Why should we wait till you become the president and not implement it now? But why don't I do it now? And, and why do I want to? I must have a manifesto. Otherwise, if I do everything now, <laughs> if I could, <laughs> what would I do when I come into office? <laughs> I mean, how can you do everything now? Um, uh, even President Mahama, former president, who, is, who was president, I'm only vice president, but he was president. Why didn't he do everything then? <laughs> I mean, why is he coming back? He had full authority. I don't have full authority. The budget that has gone to parliament, which has been passed, is not my budget. Is it my budget? It's not my budget. The budget goes in the name of the president. It doesn't go in the name of the vice president. But when you have to think about what new do you want to do, you come up with new ideas. And I've come up with new ideas, which I want to do when we come into office. Everyone who is running for office, whether you are Kamala Harris or you are Baumia, you still have to think about what you have to do when you get into office. And this is why I'm presenting my new ideas uh, as to what to do. The next question was on Coco Board. Yentia Dr. Bawumia, answer. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Esposito Inokeduse. I work with the Beat FM. Somewhere in last year, the former president, Mahama, on his campaign tour in Western North region claimed Coco Board is on the verge of collapse. Do you believe Coco Board has collapsed? And what is your plans for Coco Board? I don't want to go deep. Um, Coco Board is on the verge of collapse. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that, uh, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll look at that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I cannot comment on that. Um, it's, it's not, um, I, I, I don't know where the data is coming from. This media encounter no na for we bring down omu hwe nim say journalists no omu bisa ba when it comes to economy economy na sanya o kan here before 2016 any of you no access obey vice president and we make ye an asaden so vanessa of metro tv nebusia obisa dr bawomia and the famous quote if the fundamentals are weak the exchange rate will expose you yentie bawomia answer mr vice president you will remember this quote if the fundamentals are weak the exchange rates will expose you. And as at the time you were um, making this statement, a dollar to um, CD was three CDs and about, or about three CDs, four CDs, right, thank you. 2024, a dollar to a CD is 15 Ghana CDs, about 15 Ghana CDs. Okay, over 15 Ghana CDs, thank you. How do I explain this to my mother, a cocoa seller? that in 2014 the fundamentals were weak in 2024 
where a dollar is now 15 cities, the fundamentals are not weak. But the prices of goods and services are high today. Thank you. The nice one, Vanessa, was asking if the fundamentals are weak, the exchange rate will expose you, which is a, a truism. It was true, true then, and it's still true today. It's an economic truism that the, the, once the fundamentals weaken, you will see the impact on the exchange rate um, fundamentally. And when we talk about uh, many of these fundamentals, you're talking about the GDP growth rate, you're talking about the fiscal balance, you're talking about the, exchange, uh, the reserves, level of the reserves that you have, inflation, and so on. When we came into office, um, during the first term before we hit COVID, between 2017 and 2019, you saw the fundamentals pretty much strengthening by all accounts. And the exchange rate depreciated in those three years by less than 5%. That was the lowest depreciation in the currency for 28 years. 28 years, that was the lowest depreciation of a currency. Um, I think we went up, uh, if, I mean, even after COVID, we, we didn't get that high a depreciation. But the biggest shock for the economy came in 2022. I mean, this was, I mean, all hell was breaking loose in 2022. Inflation, 54% as at November 2022, uh, exchange rate had depreciated at 54%. I mean, and of course, you could look at the fundamentals were in trouble at that time. You saw the fiscal deficit going up. You saw inflation going up, growth uh, declining. And so for me, it wasn't uh, surprising, even though it was shocking, the extent to which the exchange rate went. So uh, the, the, the point that, that we are making is that once the fundamentals weaken, you will get it shown in the exchange rate. Uh, and this is why we have seen that recently, uh, even though we are depreciating in November at 54%, this year, the depreciation has been 18.6% so far, right? We are, we are, we are, we are looking at 18.6%. Um, so you are looking at a, a situation this year. Why, why is the depreciation lower? Because the fundamentals have strengthened. The fiscal deficit is under 5%. We are running a primary surplus uh, growth. It has gone up first quarter to 4.7% higher than projected, the reserves are increasing, uh, and the goal for oil program is helping. So as the fundamentals are, and inflation today is around 20%, um, so they, 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 it's been a strengthening of the fundamentals, and you've also seen more relative exchange rate stability. I, for, I mean, in all of this, and I... I, I I want you to, to, to take this away. When I look at um, what was happening in 2022, I mean, the 54% uh, depreciation of the city, um, it was very scary. In fact, in 2022, this, this economy was on the verge of, of collapse because you saw our reserves declining very steeply, the exchange rate was blowing up, inflation was up, and my worry at that time, frankly, was that I could see this country moving towards Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka was what was clearly in my mind at that time, because you saw protests in Sri Lanka, they had no fuel, Jumso was there, and when you saw the way our reserves were moving in 2022, 
we were heading right in that direction that we were going to get queues on the street. We, were going, we couldn't buy fuel. We couldn't pay for so many things. And it was in that context that I came up with two policies. One was the gold for oil policy and the gold purchase program of the Bank of Ghana. Because, because when I looked at it, you know, sometimes when uh, they say necessity is the mother of invention, uh, because once, when I looked at it, we were headed for disaster, you know. But I, I made the case, I looked at the numbers and I said, well, how are we going to get foreign exchange to buy fuel in this declining reserves? And then I looked at gold. I said, let's take a look at gold. I looked at the reserves of gold that we had, and it was 8.7 tons. 8.7. That is from independence to 2022. Our gold reserves were 8.7 tons. 8.7. I mean, when you look at the U.S., they had 8,000 tons in, the, in, 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 the, in gold reserves. The U.K., Germany, France, you know, all above 2,000, 3,000 tons. And Ghana, the largest gold producer in Africa, had 8.7 tons. So I said this is uh, uh, something that we need to change. And so Ghana needs to start, because the, the thing about gold for us is that we don't have to export anything to get gold. If we have CDs, we'll buy gold right here locally. So we can use our CDs to buy gold without needing to export cocoa or oil or diamonds or timber. We just buy the gold locally. That is what we have that many countries don't have. It's just something that Many, many countries don't have that uh, opportunity to do so. So I then came up with the, that idea that let's do, instead of, since we don't have forex at the bank uh, to pay for um, oil, let's use gold. And therefore, we went into this gold for oil and gold purchase program for reserves. And what is very, very interesting, frankly, without this gold for oil, the gold purchase program, this economy would have collapsed. There's no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt in my mind. Why do I say so? In the last couple of years, Bank of Ghana under the gold purchase program has been able to buy $5 billion of gold. $5 billion of gold. Think about it. We've gone to the IMF to look for three billion dollars, which is going to be paid over three years, and this is what, why we are going through. But locally, we've been able to buy five billion, and this is why there are no queues for petrol. This is why Dumso has not happened in Ghana, because we. Otherwise, where would you have gotten five billion dollars from your reserves? Where? would you have gotten $5 billion from your reserves to keep up all the payments you needed to make? So um, that has been, for us, the game changer. And so the pilot, the pilot that we are seeing with the gold purchase program and the gold for oil program, I want to institutionalize it going forward. And this is why, by the grace of God, when I am president next year, we are going to, to institutionalize this. Someone asked me, oh, why is it that the French West African countries have not seen depreciations in their currency, Côte d'Ivoire, um, Senegal, and all of these? I said, well, they are anchored. The, the currency is anchored to the euro through the French franc. So they are anchored. Unfortunately for Ghana, we don't have an anchor. There is no anchor for the city. So what I am going to introduce, what I want to institutionalize, is something that we have learned from this crisis. 
um, you will not find it in any textbook. Maybe they will, some people will now write it in a textbook. They are now, you won't find it in a textbook. It's not, it, it's not in a textbook. Because what, what I'm doing, what I'm going to do is fairly simple, as I said, but we have had to learn about it. Because what we are going to do is to say that if you want foreign exchange, and we, uh, we've tried it already, the pilot, with some of the big companies. One big company had 3.1 billion Ghana cities. They wanted to externalize 3.1 billion Ghana cities. And they were looking for foreign exchange. Can you imagine the impact on our market? If someone comes out with 3.1 billion cities looking for dollars. So they, are, they, 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 they were trying to talk to the Bank of Ghana and all of that. So their chairman flew into the country and came to see me and said, we are having these problems and we have to ex, you know, externalize our dividends and all of that. We have 3.1 billion and we are looking for dollars. So looking for dollars from all the banks and all of that. So I listened to them, and then I asked, will you take gold? They said, oh, sure, gold is forex. That is not a problem. So I called the governor and I said, look, why don't we put three, this 3.1 billion through the gold purchase program? And guess what? It was done virtually overnight and their money was given to them. So essentially, what we are, we are saying is that the demand for the dollars, you bring your cities, we have the gold. There's no doubt, I mean, the gold is there. I mean, we have five billion ounces even not yet explored, as the Geological Survey Authority has told us. That's $10 trillion, right? So bring your cities, we buy the gold, give you your forex. It's that simple. So your demand for the forex will be met by an equal supply of gold, and Ghana will see stability of the currency long term. So we're looking for a simple solution to a long term stability for the CD. And that is what we are bringing in, and that is what um, is happening. What I'll tell you, and I'm sure maybe some of you have heard, is that other countries have started coming to Ghana to learn about our gold purchase program. Yeah, other countries have started coming. Uh, the Bank of Ghana is inundated with requests for people to come and learn. As I said, this is not in textbooks, uh, but this is what we are, we are doing. So I, I, I think that the fundamentals ultimately has an impact on the exchange rate, and but, but the crisis that we have gone through has now made us to think a bit outside the box and, and, and bring in this new solution. So now, senior finance minister, but you say economy no enko ye and it's Ghana for your French or more and your mother ever pick up. So back here, now, senior John Dramani Mahama, but you say, and yes, a finance minister, boom, no apologize on a economy at the tap and some new boom, no doctor Bawumia, no, was all patch out. So Belamundi bisa Dr. Bawumia se, Dr. Amafu Chema e wasa wo pacha on the economy because atati ya pansam, yente Bawumia ansa. Would you agree with Ghanaians who say that you should apologize for where we are at the moment, especially looking at all the promises that were made and the performance not matching to those promises? Thank you very much. Question was also that should we, should I apologize for uh, not being a good economic manager. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting, you know, because when you look at the work that we have done, uh, and let me go through some of it. For the first time in our history, first time since independence, we have a national ID system. For the first time, for the first time in our history, I've championed national ID at birth for all children, all children at birth, together with their birth certificates. Never happened in our history. 
for the first time in our history with the Ghana card. You don't need a guarantor to get a student loan. The first time in our history, Ghana has a comprehensive address system. We've struggled with this for 60 years. 60 years. It's only under our government, and with my initiative, that we have a comprehensive digital address system. For the first time in our history, you have 100% access to financial inclusion in Ghana. For the first time in our history. For the first time in our history, we have drones delivering medical supplies to 2,694 facilities and saving lives. 540,000 flights have been made so far to very remote parts of Ghana. Daily, they are going an average of about 100 flights a day from each of the six drone centers. Saving lives, so many lives have been saved. Women in childbirth, needing blood, people who have been bitten by snakes, we get the report that the drones are saving. And Ghana is the whole world's largest medical drone delivery service. The whole world. The whole world. They, our people, can sit at home and enroll in national health insurance from home and renew national health insurance that they had so much problems with. Today, people can stay at home and buy electricity credit and pay their children's school fees and other things right on their mobile phone. Today, you have a lot of bureaucracy in the public service delivery space that has really been eliminated. You know, getting through passports, getting a driver's license, clearing goods at the ports, and so on, have become much easier because of digitalization than before. Much, much, much easier. Today, we have an e-pharmacy system platform in Ghana. I went to Ho in 2019, met with the pharmacists, and challenged them. I said, let's do an e-pharmacy platform. Let's bring all the pharmacies in Ghana together on one platform. And today, we have 2,456 pharmacies that have been brought together on one platform for the first time in our history, for the first time in our history. So today, if you receive a prescription from a doctor, you can get to the e-pharmacy platform, and it will tell you which pharmacy near you has the medicine and how much it costs. This is the first country in the whole of Africa to have an e-pharmacy platform, and it is Ghana. The whole of Africa to have an e-pharmacy platform, and it is Ghana. Today we have put together Ghana.gov platform where we have onboarded over 1,000 MMDAs. We, have, we, have only, we are left with less than 20 MMDAs to complete the whole Ghana.gov. So whenever you want to interact with government, you go to Ghana.gov and you either apply for the service or pay for the service or whatever. Today, when we came in, only 4% of Ghana, adult Ghanaians had a tax identification number. Today, it's 85%. And that is a major, um, a really major uh, accomplishment that we are doing. Today, what we have done for the first time in our history under the e-health program, you know, before you could go to the hospital and they will tell you your folder is missing. Today, what we have done is to digitalize the medical records and network the hospitals, teaching hospitals, all teaching hospitals, 
all regional hospitals, all district hospitals, the patient records have all been digitalized. And those hospitals are networked. So if they refer someone from Wa to Kolebu, they don't need to come with their folder. All they need is their ID number. It will be put in the computer in Kolebu, and all their medical history will appear to the government. And we are the first country in the whole of Africa to do this. And one of the few in the world, because I've been looking at uh, the, 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 the networking of hospitals across the world in this manner. We have one of the very few in the world to do this. One of the very, very few. Today, sickle cell patients are able to get hydroxyurea on the NHIS. Today, childhood cancer is covered on the NHIS. Today, we have free kidney dialysis for over 80, uh, for over 60 patients and, that, and under 80, 18 patients. Today, we have the National Rental Assistance Scheme for the first time in our history to deal with this problem of rent advance. And as I said, it's working very, very well, and we will do it. Today, for the first time in our history, we have the Zongo Development Fund, over 200 projects, and we are moving um, forward with that. Today, for the first time in our history, we've implemented a gold purchase program at the Bank of Ghana. We've also brought in gold for oil program, which is going to be a major thing for our economy going forward. And today, what one of the things that we have done, which will be hopefully outdooring before the end of this year, is to bring in a local Uber-like app for our local taxis. Taxis have major problems because they are being outcompeted by Uber. They, we have done an app for them, and they will soon be able to operate like the way the Uber or Yango or Bolt is operating. So that when we take a taxi, we don't have to be taking the money abroad. We can keep the money in Ghana. And that work has been virtually completed and we will outdoor it very, very soon. Uh, in a, so when you look at how we are changing Ghana and you look at the performance of the economy, before um, we came into office. We are doing much better across virtually every sector than the man who wants to come back. Every sector. He, the man who wants to come back, right? So I am very proud of my record. Very, very proud of it. So, I know a journalist, but I also want to Dr. Baume, I said, who opened it? Mahama. And some way, not the other one. What did you say? Your Excellency, uh, former President Mahama says you were supposed to be an economic messiah, uh, but you seem to have failed in the management of the economy. Do you have any response? It's about what the former uh, president um, supposed to have said uh, about me being an economic messiah, supposedly, uh, who has failed. Um, sometimes I get a little surprised and, uh, and amazed uh, the former president when he talks about economic mismanagement because <laughs> he, should, he, he, he should know his own record. I mean, we don't all have short memories. We really don't all have short memories. His record in economic management, what he left us with in 2016, was an abysmal record. It's just an abysmal record. We had endured doom so for four years with all the destruction of industry and livelihoods that happened. People died because of doom so in hospitals. The National Health Service was virtually collapsed. Remember, we are basically back to a cash and carry system. The National Ambulance Service was virtually dead. 
We had on maybe about 37 ambulances for the whole country. Unemployment as a result was very high. Agriculture, GDP growth had declined to 3.4%. Agricultural growth had declined to 2.9%. And of course, industry growth had collapsed because of doom so. Unemployment was high. There was a freeze on public recruitment as a result. And the banking sector was virtually was on the verge of collapse. We had, as a result, the cancellation of teacher training allowances, the cancellation of nursing training allowances. You had a three-month pay policy for teachers, could work for three years and be paid. And many children could not attend senior high school because of difficulties of paying fees and so on. You had many, many challenges that he left us with. You know, so when you juxtapose that record with what we have been able to do in these last eight years almost, it's really night and day. You know, we have created at least 2.1 million jobs. Uh, the latest number I saw was 2.3 million. But let's say at least 2.1 million jobs in the last seven years. And this is hard data I'm talking about, 2.1 million jobs. We've kept the public sector workers employed and fully paid through the COVID pandemic. We didn't lay anybody off. And if you look at it, we've built more roads, more roads, three times more the length of roads than what he did in office. We've built more railway than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Expanded rural telephony. There were 78 sites for rural telephony when we came in. Today, there are 1,008 sites for rural telephony. We built more libraries, public libraries, than any other government. I mean, his time, he built only three, eight years, three public libraries, eight years. And we've built 54 public libraries in eight years. We've constructed about 12 major fish landing sites across the country. Zim, Dixcove, Marie, Mumford, Winneba, Senyabriku, Gomoa, Fete, Teshi, Osu, Ekumfi, and Infasima. Constructed two fishing harbors in Elmina and Jamestown. Constructed more sanitation facilities, 817, than any other government in the Fourth Republic. This has increased the proportion of the population with access to toilet facilities from 33% in 2016 to 80%. And 5,400 communities have been declared open defecation free. We've built more sports facilities in Ghana than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Mm. Whether you're talking about Boteman or the University of Ghana and so on. When we came into office, there were only three astroturfs in the whole of Ghana. The whole of Ghana, three. Today, you have over 150. We've abolished the three-month pay policy, constructed 120 courts. We are constructing 80 have been completed with bungalows. Um, and we've kept the lights on live broadly in, in the last eight years. We've restored teacher and nursing training allowances. We've increased the beneficiaries of scholarships by 70%. And the national health insurance is now being extended to cover sickle cell patients with hydroxyurea, very expensive drug. I led the negotiations for that to happen. We have extended the national health insurance to cover childhood cancer, extended the national health insurance to cover kidney dialysis for over 60s and under 18s.
we saved the deposits of 4.6 million bank depositors who, who really um, were going to lose their deposits if those banks were not, were not saved. I don't understand whether the former president has taken his time to actually understand what happened in the banking sector. Some atrocious things happened. And this is why these banks had to be saved. They were not collapsed, they were merged into other banks. And we no banking depositor lost one city. Everybody maintained. And we saved 4.6 million depositors. I will ask the former president, if he hasn't read, to go and read the receiver's report, or to go and read the Bank of Ghana report, and acquaint himself <laughs> before making any further comments on matters he clearly does not understand. He needs to get an understanding before you make comments. And you cannot hand over a bank's license to them. This is subject to legal procedure. <laughs> you have to go to court. You, you don't have the power in our constitution to do that. And I, I'm surprised sometimes because he has been president before and he should know these things. He should know these things. <laughs> he should know these things. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have tripled the capitation grant per child since we came into office, from five CDs to 15 CDs. And what is interesting also is that we've had the lowest increase in electricity tariffs in recent history. Between his time, 2009, and 2016, when they were in office, the average annual increase in electricity tariffs was 50% a year. That's the average. Some of the years were 80%. Between 2009 and 2016, 50% average a year. In the last eight years, the average increase in electricity prices has been 11.1%. This is the lowest average increase of any government since 1992. Any government since 1992. When we came in, we bought, in our first term, we abolished and reduced 21 separate taxes. And we reduced import duties by 50% between 2019 and 2021. 50% reduction in import duties. And that, of course, we had to go back on that when we got into the crisis. We introduced the National Rental Assistance Scheme to help to deal with this problem of rent advance. And it is one of the best schemes that we have seen. It has worked very well, and we are going to expand it um, for the rest of the country. We are going to put in serious money, because with that, you don't need to pay two years rent advance. Uh, we will uh, pay the landlord and you just pay monthly um, and it's working and then of course working with the private sector. Infant mortality under our government has come down from 37.9 in 2016 to 31.7 and in terms of leap livelihood empowerment against poverty we have increased payments almost tenfold from 49 million that we used to pay every year to 423 million leap payments. Now, national health insurance, NHIS expenditure has also gone up from 1.1 billion to 6.8 billion. During COVID, we had free water for everybody for a year and free electricity for lifeline consumers, and all of that. We brought in over 4 million beneficiaries now under school feeding, up from 1.6 million. We've absorbed the examination fees for all students of B, C, and WAXI. People were sacked from examination centers for not paying examination fees before we came into 
We've doubled the number of student loan recipients from 30,000 to 58,000, almost double. We've also, of course, introduced mobile money interoperability to make every, almost every adult Ghanaian have a bank account uh, through the Momo's account interoperability with the bank account. In fact, the whole of Africa, Ghana is the only country with 100% access to financial inclusion. 100%. The whole of Africa, Ghana is the only country with 100% access to financial inclusion. What is interesting is that when I first made a statement and I said Ghana was the first country in Africa to have mobile money interoperability between banks and Momo accounts. Uh, some people decided to fact check me. And they said that I was wrong. Just that they didn't understand the, the, <laughs> the terrain, the fact checkers. So I took my time to explain to the fact checkers exactly what was happening in the field. Unfortunately, once they understood it, they didn't come back to withdraw. <laughs> They just kept quiet. You know, today, when chalk was a problem, remember, chalk in our schools under the former president, when it was a problem, today we have acquired tablets to give to the students. Every senior high school student is getting a tablet that we, we, we are having. So I'm just putting some of these points together, you know, Agenda 111, so far we've built 47 hospitals, 428 CHIPS compounds, 230 health centers. I mean, that is massive. That's excluding Agenda 111. We've brought in drone delivery, and Ghana is now the whole world, the largest medical de drone delivery service in the whole world. We are leading uh, the world. The ambulance service, which was collapsing, we've brought in one constituency, one ambulance, and we are making a lot of um, progress in that direction. So I think that, I mean, what is clear, I, I, I don't have to go through every sector. I, the data, for me, I speak only with data. And the data is very, very clear that we have our government, we have outperformed the government of former President Mahama in the management of the economy in virtually every sector. Virtually every sector. You tell me whether it's GDP growth, whether it's per capita income, whether it is industry growth. I mean, virtually every sector we have outperformed. So he either does not read or he does not understand the data. He needs to do one of the two. Take his time to read the data and understand what it is before he comes out to speak, because he will speak out of ignorance. Because if you understand the data, and I believe that as a former president, he does understand the data. He must understand the data. And I believe that is why he doesn't want to debate me. I believe so. That is why he doesn't want to debate me. He's, uh, he's running away from that. But, so if, according to him, our, we have mismanaged the economy in the midst of a global crisis, in the midst of a global crisis, if our mismanaged economy is outperforming you in virtually every sector. This economy that you are saying has been mismanaged. We are performing you in GDP growth, in per capita income, in G gross international reserves, in every sector, roads, hospitals, schools, everything. Free SHS, all of that. If this is the mismanaged economy that is outperforming you in your economy that had no global crisis, no crisis at all, but you couldn't afford chalk. Yeah. 
You couldn't afford chalk. But there was no crisis. So if our mismanaged economy is performing better than your, man, your better managed economy, uh, then <laughs> in that case, you, you must not have been very good. Let me put it mildly. I was going to say incompetent. Because our bad economy is very, it's much better than your good economy. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You know, so I think that the matter, I hope, that this matter can be settled. There, 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 there's no way, there's no way he can say that his economy, that he managed as, as president, by the way, I'm not yet president, in another three months, inshallah. Yeah, I mean, let, let us settle this matter. And you are members of the press. You, you read the data. You follow the data. You know the data. You know that we have done better than him. So why does he want to come back? I mean, it's like you go for an exam with someone in school. You score 70%. They score 30%. And they want to convince people that they are better than you. It doesn't make sense in, the, in that sense. So I, I, I seriously believe that that statement, you know, um, th that we have failed. Uh, of course, we've had challenges. Nobody can say we haven't had challenges. We, we have had challenges, serious challenges, challenges that have kept me up at night. In 2022, that was the horrible year for us, 2022. Petrol prices went up to 23 CDs per liter. We were losing reserves so badly, you know, and you saw food prices going up and all of that. That was a real challenge that we had to deal with. And this is how we came up with the whole gold for oil, gold purchase program, and that has really helped us. Today, Ghana, today, notwithstanding all the challenges. We are the 10th lowest price in terms of petroleum in Africa, the whole of Africa. Ghana is number 10 in those of lowest prices of petroleum products. We are number 10, 10th lowest. The lowest is Libya. Then you move through Egypt and Sudan and all of those to come to number 10, which is Ghana. Ghana, we are priced around 13, 14 CDs per liter right now. Cote d'Ivoire is priced 23 CDs per liter, as uh, Hassan was just telling me earlier on when I asked. You know, 10th lowest, uh, we, are, we still want to bring it lower. But in 2022, at the time I announced the Gold for Oil program, when I said we had to attack this thing with Gold for Oil, the prices were 23 CDs per liter at that time. So um, we've had challenges. It's not uh, everything is, is not where we want it to be, but I believe that we can work better. But I don't think the former president can lecture us on economic management. He just cannot. His record would not allow him to lecture us on economic management. Thank you. Your Excellency. But at this point, Your Excellency, we are going to time you because if we follow the former president, you talk, sir. We are going to time you. Aha, na asam no wano. So this journalist, Obisa Dr. Mahamud Bawumia, said, Dr. Bawumia, about this current government now, on one case, I will come on. On board, and you may know, I'll be to meet in the city, and I'll say, this part of the government in Ufili, and written, or bar, or be in the See any answer. Mr. Vice President, can you state two failures of your current administration which you seek to correct? And how do you intend to do this differently should you become the president? Thank you. The question, what sort of, what failures that you think in this government that you would seek to correct? Um, I was thinking a little bit about that. 
I don't know if, if I mean, for one, for one I, I, I think that um, I, I wish we had built in, for example, we had started the gold purchase program much earlier. Um, if we had started it in our first term of office, for example, the buffer in terms of gold reserves would have been much, much uh, bigger. As I said, a few years ago, we had 8.7 tons of gold, and I think so far we are almost uh, getting, they've bought close to about 72 tons or so. So it's very, I mean, something that I wish when I sit back and look and I say, wow, I wish we had, we had been able to, to buy a bit more uh, and start uh, gold for oil and, and gold for reserves uh, much, much earlier. Um, but as I said, the crisis is what really made us to to get into these these policies, um, of course, I also um, wish that we had, uh, even though we built more school infrastructure than any government, I believe that um, we've had uh, still had challenges um, with the uh, senior high school in terms of infrastructure, uh, and I wish we had completed a bit more in terms of the accommodation, dining hall, and so on. But this is one of the reasons why um, I want us to move a lot of the uh, government expenditure away from government to the private sector. This is a major policy that we are coming up with, that we want to engage the private sector in a lot of expenditure that government normally will put on the budget. And a lot of infrastructure is part of what government puts uh, on the budget and places like roads and, and you tend to see a lot of uncompleted buildings. But if you go to places like Legon or Tech, most of the accommodation, the hostels is provided by the private sector and all we do is rent it and pay. And I believe that we can have that model where the private sector is engaged to, to, to build a lot of infrastructure and we'll pay them um, uh, rent or lease it or whatever over time. So I believe that will give a lot of uh, fiscal space but also allow us to complete all of these buildings and so on. But this is where I want to take uh, uh, Ghana in the next session that we should move more towards the private sector provision of a lot of this and that will really bring down the fiscal burden on government in providing some of these. Dr. Baumiani opponent in Pen Bibrinano, I omit Bau Bidiano, Mokan and say, Oh, hashtag Baulaya, Baumion, kind of crap. And on a bush, a book answer. One journalist, Obi Sana said, Dr. Baumia, who opponent or much my word, your own kind of crap, we are liar. Now, response, Ben, or whatever, Momo. Hm, yet see Baumia. Mr. Vice President and incoming president. Some of us are already convinced that you are going to be the president of Ghana. But the, some people out there are campaigning that you are a liar. I just want you to tell the people of Ghana who you are, why you want to be president of this republic. Thank you. Uh, people calling me a liar, and then you go, you know, and, and that is very, I said to someone, well, uh, at least I'm not called a murderer, as my boss was called, or I'm not called a drug dealer, or even I'm not called government official one. <laughs> Many of the things that I, 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 I'm trying to do um, in, in the policy space are a little futuristic in nature. Many people don't seem to usually understand them at the time when I start talking about them. They, they immediately come and say, oh, well, he, he's lying. But you remember when I talked about drones coming into Ghana, what did they say? That uh, I was lying, that uh, the drones are coming to take pictures of naked women in their bathrooms. I, I mean, that was the, the, the response about drones. 
uh, and when I said Ghana was the world's largest medical drone delivery service, they said, ah, they, he's lying, it's not true. Well, when we talked about digital property address system, they said he was lying, you know. This is not this thing. When I said that um, <laughs> mobile money interoperability, Ghana was the first in Africa to do mobile money interoperability of, between bank accounts and the Momo account that we have done. Uh, they said I was lying, you know, and then, but usually after they say I'm lying, when I'm proven right, they don't come back to say I was right. When I said that you could use the Ghana card to travel from outside Ghana into Ghana, they said I was lying. Today, people are using it and, tra and traveling very easily. When we, I said we're going to build hostels for Kaya Ye, they said I was lying. And then we've built the hostels, they've not said anything. Um, when I said we will restore tree training allowances, they said I was lying. Um, when I talked about the uh, rent advance loans so that people will not have to pay rent advance through the National Rental Ass Assistance Scheme, they said I was lying. Um, free SHS, when we talked about it, they said it was 419. Uh, agenda 111, when I mooted this idea about Agenda 111 and we announced it, they said it was a lie, it was not feasible. Um, the digital, uh, the Zungo Development Fund similarly, and when I talked about credit scoring, uh, it was not in existence, it, hasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, seen as, uh, as true, you know. So there, there's a pattern that is uh, going on, but I have to thank Joy FM. Um, in June uh, 2023, Joy FM did a report together with the African Academy for Open Source Investigations. And the, that report revealed that the coordinated sharing of that hashtag Bawulaya tweets by 28 accounts using copy and paste technique in an inorganic, uh, is an inorganic creature created by the opposition NDC to smear me. This was the finding of, of Joy FM, not me, that they had created uh, these fake accounts um, and sharing Baulaya tweets and, 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 and they had said that this, is, um, this was a deliberate attempt by the NDC to smear me. So I take it uh, as par for the course. I have a solid record of accomplishment as vice president. Very solid. <clears throat> I have at least, I can point to 33 separate policy initiatives. 33 that I have championed or initiated as vice president. 33. My opponent cannot point to one. One, just one. Bakope, just one. One, one single policy initiative as a vice president. One, he can't. I mean, if you are serious about solving the problems of this country, at least you must think of something. You must think of something. You cannot just be eating and going to sleep every day. You must think of something. You must be policy oriented. I mean, we are, we are put into public office to solve problems. You cannot be there as MP, as minister, as vice president, as president, and you don't have a policy initiative. Just one. I mean, you need your leaders to be problem solvers. So you must have thought through problems and come up with initiatives to solve the problems. I can talk about 33 different policy initiatives. My opponent cannot talk of one, and he wants to be given the mandate. Miracles, do I have the floor? Yes, Paul. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Vice President and colleague journalist. Uh, I think we're having a very interesting time. Mr. Vice President, I covered the NPP presidential primaries in 1998. I covered election 2000. I covered the NDC contest for election 2004, the one between Mills and Kwesi Butri. 
I covered election 2004, 2008, 12, 16, 20. I have never seen a presidential candidate, whether in opposition or in government, focusing his campaign to the people about policy initiatives and policies that have been achieved. I also covered the UK election in 2001 for Tony Blair, and I covered also the UK election in 2019. You will find in those places that they were always articulating policy, what can be done, what can be solved. You will find here in all of those historical elections that we were not doing that until Muhammad Dubaumia arrived on the scene. Mr. Vice President, whatever happens in December, you have changed the politics of Ghana and Africa for a long time to come. I have nothing more useful to add except that God bless you. Thank you, Paul. God bless. You. God bless you too. Into where you are, course, we are but we are host media. No, it was a question. We a journalist. No, we are a doctor. Mahamudu, but we are so the answer to questions. Ah. Journalist no umubisa yon. Master wa sa obe chile wa adri amami ewa comment section ho. Na obe share video we ma for frosu en sa ebe kemi midi edi kujo black macro. Sending money abroad just got a whole lot easier with AfriX. A slick app makes international transfer crazy fast and super secure. Just tap a few buttons. Money sent across the board in a minute. One magic of AfriX is that you can add your debit card or load money to your AfriX wallet right in the app and send those funds to your recipients overseas straight to their bank account at lightning speed and zero fees. You can earn a one-time bonus of $20 if you refer your friends and they send up to $150. Whether you're in the USA, Canada, Europe or anywhere in the world, AfriX. Best rates at no cost with no hidden fees. <laughs>